I believe that everyone is here for a purpose, that God has a reason for you being here today and the opportunity that I have to speak uh, into your life. We don't definitely take it for granted. Excited with the service time change. Um, I hope that works for everyone. If not, make it work for you. But it's going to allow our teams, it's really going to help our teams in this season. And when we move into the new building, we got to go to two services anyway. So we'll just make that adjustment now. So for you guys, it's just going 45 minutes earlier, 10 a.m. How many, how many of Jesus rose from the grave, you can get out of bed to be a 10 a.m. service? Amen. All right. We're not worried about the other ones, but just, just you guys. Okay. Um, how many of you appreciate the worship team? I know they already went off the platform. Come on, just thank them. I, I lead worship every blue moon. I used to lead worship all the time. You know, I was a worship leader before I did anything else. And I, I do it every blue moon. And every blue moon that I do it, like today, I wonder, why am I doing this? You know, it, it takes a lot of work. And it just reminds me how much time and effort they put into it. So grateful for them. In fact, everyone who serves here in Arise, come on, can we just get here a thank you for that? I want to share a message with you today, and it's a message that over the last couple of days has really weighed, it's weighed heavy on my heart. And it's a sermon, as I put it together, I started off here, and I feel like I kind of came here. And yesterday, it was just heavy on me as I was meditating on it, going over it, going over my notes, even into the evening right before I went to sleep. And it's a message that I simply entitled Identity Theft. Identity Theft. Has anyone here ever had your identity stolen? Anyone here? Just raise your hand. You had your, okay, I see one hand, another hand, another hand. Um, someone back there. We've had different people in different services. You have your identity stolen at some point or some time. In 2021, identity theft cost Americans $56 billion. $56 billion. How many know that's a lot of money? $56 billion that was stolen, stolen from maybe even some of you, and no one put a gun into your face. No one put a knife to your throat. No one held you hostage. They were able to do it, oftentimes from a distance, someone that you've never seen, and they were able to take your identity. Maybe they drained your bank account. They, dr they drained your debit card. They did something, and they stole from you. The financial burden is one thing, but there's also the emotional and physically exhausting toll that it takes on people. The countless phone calls that you may need to make and explanations you have to give people, the tension it can put on your family and your marriage, especially if your account has been drained, it takes a lot out of you. Now, when you think in this world, all right, I want you to picture this, that there are people who wake up every day and their sole purpose every day is to figure out how to steal one of our identities here. They wake up every day. That's their job. They want to steal your identity. There are people in the world that wake up every day with evil thoughts, evil intentions. Do you realize that? I heard somebody say that there's, there are people that wake up every day. Their goal is to figure out how can I kill more Americans, people in other parts of the world. And their thinking is evil. And there are people that will wake up every day thinking, how can I steal someone's identity? Now, God has given every single one of us an identity. He's given you an identity. He's made you who you are, and there's a God-given identity. In fact, God gives all of his creation an identity. When you look at the animals, there is an identity. When you look at things, there's an identity. God even gave Lucifer who we call Satan, an identity. When you read in the Bible, Satan was basically Lucifer in heaven. He was an angel. And you could say he was the worship leader in heaven. He was, you got to imagine, he was beautiful. He, he wasn't evil. But Satan rejected God's identity for himself, and he took on his own identity, 
And he's tempting every single one of us every day to do the same. To reject God's identity for our life and to take another identity to throw out the identity that God has placed on us. And there's a devil that wants to influence and to change our identity. And if the line in this world, if people can steal your identity in this world, people that we can see, imagine the enemy that we can't see when he goes to work in our spirit and the lies that he places in our life and the things that he tries to get us to believe. Imagine what he can get us to do or to believe or to go off course or to give up when it comes to our identity in Christ Jesus. You know, when it comes to identity, even in the world, the, the culture that we are living in today, there is confusion in identity. There are people who are born men who say they are women, women who are born as women who are saying they are men. And who would have imagined that with you look at what would be people would say the liberal world or liberal ideology when it comes to political things and cultural things that one of the hardest questions for them to answer today is what is a woman who would have thought that 10 years ago and there's confusion in that in fact we have now a supreme court justice sitting on our court, a Supreme Court justice who wasn't able to answer the question, what is a woman? And you say, well, why does that matter? Well, what happens when there's lawsuits, and I think there will be, there are going to be suits that are going to be brought, especially when it comes to sports and women's sports. You may call, you say, but this is an old-fashioned pastor. I am old-fashioned if you think that what I believe that girls should challenge girls and guys should challenge guys. I'm old-fashioned. In fact, I just read on a high school that recently pulled out of a sporting event just last week because one of their female athletes was injured by a, an athlete in the other school who was a guy who identifies as a girl and challenged. They were challenging that sports and injured, and they said, no, we're done. And you, you look at this, who would, who would have thought this 10 years ago? You know, I remember when I first heard about people identifying as different genders, and I just remember thinking, this is silly. This is silly. And not, not really thinking much of it and thinking, well, common sense is going to prevail, obviously. People are going to shoot this down. And I think it's, been, it's, it's a reflection when you look at the church today, because at that time, really, churches didn't say much. We thought maybe this is something that would pass. And today, we're living in a culture where this is stuff that we're having to deal with. What we thought maybe was small, we thought was minor, where we thought, well, no, we don't want to get political because we thought this was a political thing when really it was a spiritual thing. And confusion begin to come in. Identity has been confused. And now we are in a place where, man, we got a mess on our hands. Teachers are having to deal with this. Parents are having to deal with this. You have students that are having to deal with this. You look at the political parties. You know, this is, this is election season. You got ballots that have come in. And I, and I want to encourage you today, you need to vote righteousness. You need to vote righteousness. We have to vote kingdom values. Now, some of you are very uncomfortable because I'm talking about this. Um, our president, Lyndon Johnson, when he was senator, in, put a law into place that said churches wouldn't be able to endorse political candidates or they would lose their nonprofit status. He did that because there was a pastor who was talking about him. He introduced that law and it was passed. And the churches have been for the most part silent when it comes to these things. I'm reading a book right now called A Letter to the American Church and the author says, how can we separate politics from our faith? And as I was studying this identity theft, and it started out just looking at the lies that we believe, 
I began to realize that I believe the church has lost the identity that God has placed on us. You, what do we talk about a lot of times in church? We say, well, we want to influence the world. You hear that? We say that. We want to influence our community. But yet we stay in our four walls. We don't talk much about politics. We don't vote. We don't get out there. We don't vote for righteousness. How are we going to influence the world if we're just staying in the church and we keep our thoughts in the church? God has given every single one of you a voice. And you have a right to vote. You have a right to vote righteousness. And in the world today, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy the things that are happening that people may, may want to say is normal. And, and today, uh, when you stand for truth, people will say, oh, that's hate. Truth is hate to those who hate the truth. Two political parties, when it comes to politics, if you don't know this already, then you, you've had your head in the sand. Politicians are corrupt everywhere. Not every politician, but I would wager most, some form or some way. In America, they say it's the only place you, politicians go in. They come out richer than before they went in. Figure that out. I don't know. It's, it's the world we're in. But right now, where we are, two major political parties, Republicans and Democrats. And when I look at both, I can see right now that there is one party that would be more anti-family, one party that would be anti-girl sports, one party that would be more anti-family, anti-church, and anti-God, one, fa- one party that is definitely pro-abortion, and that's the Democratic Party. And all I'm saying is today, you need to look at your vote. Don't just vote because that's how mom or dad voted. I heard somebody say John F. Kennedy would be considered a conservative today because of the things that he believes. And there is an agenda. You say, how did we get to this place? There's been an agenda. And we've missed out on the opportunity for the church to stand and to speak and to be who God's called us to be, the church, the salt of the earth. And you say, well, oh, you're, you're just all against them. I'll tell you what, if it flipped tomorrow and all of a sudden they're supporting that and, and the Republicans are against it, I'll tell you what, I'd say, look, we got to vote this way. We're going to vote righteousness because I don't, I don't serve. I'm not loyal to the donkey. I'm not loyal to the elephant. I'm loyal to the lamb. Amen. And we got to remember that today. And God has given you the opportunity to speak out. A a Democrat politician that's trying to enact a law in her state right now, some on the East Coast, that would make it illegal for a parent to question their child if their child says, I feel like I'm another gender. They want to legislate what you can do to your children. And I tell you, when it comes down to our kids, it makes me upset when I see there are people, there are organizations out there who fully cut, support the cutting off of minors' breasts and boys' genitalia when they're kids because they might feel like they're another gender. The World Professional Association for Transgender Health said hormones could be started at age 14, two years earlier than the group's previous advice. Some surgeries done at 15 or 17, a year earlier than previous guidance. Look at this. The group acknowledged potential risks, but said it's unethical and harmful to withhold early treatment. Who's speaking for truth? We need to stand because when we don't, we lose our identity. Confusion comes in. And I, I am not making this up. We're at a place now where there are people who are identifying as animals, as cats, and as wolves. And you might laugh about that now. But if we're not bringing truth into the world, where, where does this one day take us? Where does this take us? There's a documentary that came out that's called What is a Woman? And now he's saying, I think the next one needs to be What is a Human? Because of the confusion. And I'm going to get back to us in a few moments as, as far as individual. But I feel that here in this election season, it's important for us to remember, in that book I'm reading, it parallels the 
church in Nazi Germany to the church in America today. As Nazi, the Nazis, they were a political party. And as they were rising to power, the churches said nothing. They did nothing. There was a few. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was one of them. He was put to death for the stance that he took against Hitler. But most time, most people there were quiet. And they would have said that before that, Germany would have been a Christian nation. They didn't say anything when they started saying that Jews couldn't hold a job anywhere. The church didn't say anything. Then they started saying the Jews, if they're Jewish, they can't pastor a church. Pastors were silent. And they slowly gave in. Listen to this. This is by someone from that time. He said a railroad track ran behind our small church, and each Sunday morning, we would hear the whistle from a distance and then the clacking of the wheels moving over the track. We became disturbed when one Sunday we noticed cries from the train as it passed by. We grimly realized that the train was carrying Jews. They were like cattle in those cars. Week after week, the train whistle would blow. We would dread to hear the sound of those wheels because we knew that the Jews would would begin to cry out to us as they passed by our church. It was so terribly disturbing. We could do nothing to help these poor, miserable people, yet their screams tormented us. We knew exactly what time the whistle would blow, and we decided that the only way to keep from being so disturbed by their cries was to start singing our hymns. And by the time the train came rumbling by our churchyard, we were singing at the top of our voices. If some of the screams reached our ears, we just sing a little louder until we could hear them no more. Years have passed. No one talks about it much anymore, but I still hear that train whistle in my sleep. I can still hear them crying out for help. God forgive all of us who call ourselves Christians yet did nothing to intervene. And I wonder today, we as the church, Arise Church, are we just going to sing louder while the world goes to hell? Or are we going to realize our identity, even what God has called us to be, salt in the world and take a stand? And you say, Pastor, why, why, would, why would you say that? Why would you even say this? Why, why are you getting so political right now? And I'll tell you why. It's because we can't separate the two. And if we allow things to go out in the world, eventually it starts happening in our home. And God has called us to speak a voice. Say, well, you, you could lose your nonprofit status. I would rather pay taxes and speak truth than to have my truth silenced. Amen. And there has been a, an attack on truth. And I believe that there's people in the world that are looking for truth. And I, I want our church always to be a place of truth. I support family. I believe in family. I believe in, in children. I, I believe that they should be protected. I believe in life. I don't support abortion. I never have. And I'm not going to vote for a candidate who does. And there are Christians that do it. And I just want to say, you better reevaluate what you do because you're going to have to stand before God one day and give account. And so in closing this part, some of you, whew, yeah, let's move on. I just say this. Look, we need people in Arise Church that will run for office. We need righteous people that will run for office. We need righteous parents. You need to get on your school boards. You need to let your voice be heard. Don't just leave it up to all of these other people, these ungodly people who don't share the same values. Get on there. Let your voice be be heard. 1 Corinthians 14.33 tells us that God is not the author of confusion. And there is confusion in the world. Satan brings confusion. Do you ever wonder why the devil hates you so much? It's because when he looks at you, he sees God. He sees the resemblance of God. I was talking to somebody once, and this is, you might think this is horrible, but it's the truth. I was talking to somebody, and, and it was a complicated family. You ever been in a complicated family situation? Complicated family situation. And, and it was, 
you know, with their ex and, and the stepchild and this and that, and they couldn't stand their ex. They didn't really have a problem with the child, but this is what they said. Every time I see him, it reminds me of him, and it just makes me all upset every time I see them. That's a horrible thing. I get it. All right, you're like, oh, that's, that's not the kid's fault. But let me tell you, I, just thought, I, I thought of that because when the devil sees you, he sees the resemblance of your father. That's why he hates you. That's why he wants to destroy you. That's why he wants to steal your identity. That's what the devil is out there to do. You see, in Genesis chapter 6, or Genesis 1 verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. In our image according to our likeness. And let me tell you, when it comes to pronouns, God is the only they, them, all right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It says, we're going to make man in our image according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God created male and female in his image. And when Adam and Eve were created and they came to earth, what happened? They they were created in the image of God. There was no sin. What does sin do? Sin separates us from God. There was no sin. So they had fellowship with God. They had communion with God. They could interact with God. And then the serpent came, the devil came, and convinced them to eat the fruit. And Eve ate the fruit. Adam ate the fruit. And what happened when they ate the fruit, sin entered into the human race. They were now separated from God. There was a barrier that came at that moment. And when you look at Genesis chapter 5, look at this. Adam lived 130 years. He begot a son in his own likeness and after his image. See, in Genesis chapter 1, it was after God's likeness, after God's image, and then after sin enters into the picture, it was after his own likeness, and after his image, sin entered into the human race. Now, when the devil was tempting Eve, what did the devil promise Eve? What, 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 what did the devil say to Eve? If you eat this fruit, you will become like God. If you eat this fruit, you'll become like God. He said, look, basically God doesn't want you to be like him. He doesn't want you to know everything that he knows. So eat this fruit and you can be like God. God created man and woman in his own and in his... God created man and woman in his own and in his own... The devil told to Eve, if you eat this fruit, you will become like God created man and woman in his own and in his own. The devil said, eat this fruit and you'll become like What did the devil do to Eve? He lied to her about her identity. She didn't need to eat a fruit to become like God. She was already like God. God created her from the beginning in his own image and in his own likeness. And he came to her with a lie and say, if you eat this fruit, then you will be like God. But when she ate the fruit, sin came in and it actually separated her and it separated Adam from God. The devil convinced her that her identity wasn't good enough and really she just needed to have faith in God and to trust God. But the devil stole that, stole their identity. Because it's God who gives us our identity. Jacob, when you read the story of Jacob, as he's traveling, he has an encounter with God, he wrestles with God, and what does God do? God gives him a new name, a new identity. He says, from here on, you're going to be called Israel. Touches his hip dislocates it because they're wrestling and they don't stop. It says for the rest of his life, he walked with a limp. I heard somebody say this, don't ever trust anyone who doesn't walk with a limp. God touched him. He was changed. God gave him a new name, 
a new purpose, a new destiny for his life because it's God who gives us, all right, identity. When Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, when he came out of the water, there was an audible voice from heaven. And that voice from heaven, they could hear it. It said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. God was affirming the identity of Jesus Christ. Affirming who he was. Now, what's interesting about that is as soon as God affirms who Jesus was, what's the next thing that you read in the Bible? What happens? Jesus goes into the wilderness to fast, to pray, and after 40 days of fasting, who shows up? The devil. And what's the first thing the devil says? If you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. If you are the Son of God, jump off of that tower. Let the angels save you. As soon as God affirmed who Jesus was, the devil was there right away to challenge the identity of Jesus Christ. And what did Jesus do every time the devil challenged who God said he was? I love this part. Jesus answered with the word. Jesus responded by saying, it is written. It is written. Isn't it funny how anytime God wants to affirm something in your life, he does a miracle in your life. He wants to do a work in your life. The devil comes right away to try and steal that. And you walk away thinking just a little later, I don't know if God really forgave me. I don't know if he really can forgive me. I don't know if God can really love me. I don't know if God can really use me. And we buy into the doubt. I want to tell you, Jesus didn't respond by saying, well, I feel like God might love me. I feel like I'm happy today, so maybe it's good. No, he responded with the word of God. He said, it is written. Arise, church. That's why you need to read your Bible. You got to get God's word in you. Because if you don't, you're going to be confused of who you are. Your emotions will determine who you are. Your circumstances are going to determine who you are. Jesus responded with the word. We have to speak God's word into our life and into our identity to combat the lies of the devil. But here's the thing, truth. Truth makes people upset today. Truth seems like hate to those who hate the truth. And you hear that a lot. We're called to speak truth. I want to be a church that's filled with truth. I don't want to be silent while the world goes to hell. There's people that need to know that there's truth. Truth in love. Before Jesus ever performed the miracle, or before he even technically began his ministry on earth, the Father says, I'm well pleased with him. You know that tells us today there's nothing more that you need to do to have God love you. You might have walked in saying, I, I just need to, I, I need to do this. So God, no, 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 no. He loves you. He loves you. Don't let the devil lie to separate you. God loves you today. You are his treasure. He values you. He's pleased with you. You are a new creation. You know, the devil wants us to look through the guilt of our past, but God wants us to look what I wrote down faith forward today. We know what we did in our past, but we're not going to be defined by our past. Amen. And when you're here, you're here and maybe the devil has clothed you in shame and guilt and condemnation. You've allowed him to steal your identity. You think to yourself, I'm worthless. Nobody loves me. God doesn't love me. I'm horrible. I'm a mistake. I'm guilty. I should just kill myself. I want to tell you, 2 Corinthians tells us that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new new person, the old life is gone, and a new life has begun. Who wrote that? Paul. 
who was Saul, who used to throw Christians into prison, who used to persecute Christians, and who murdered and oversaw the murder of Christians. He said, look, the olds are gone. A new life has come through Christ. Did Paul forget about what he did? No. First Timothy chapter 1, what does Paul say? I'm the worst sinner of them all. In other words, I know what I did, but I know who I am today in Christ Jesus. And if you're here today and you're in Christ, there is a new identity that you can receive from the Lord. What is that identity? Who am I in Christ? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to tell you right now. And we're going to release you so you can go to lunch. Psalms 139 says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Deuteronomy 28 tells us I am the head and not the tail. I am blessed going in and I'm blessed going out. Everything that I put my hand to will prosper and will be blessed. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says I am the righteousness of God. Ephesians chapter 1, my sins are forgiven. John, 1 John chapter 3, I am a child of God. John chapter 15, he chose me. Galatians chapter 4, I am an heir of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 15, I am a friend of God. Romans chapter 8, all things work together for good in my life. Romans chapter 8, I'm more than a conqueror. Philippians 4, 19, my God provides for my every need. 1 Peter chapter 2, I am God's chosen treasure. Mark 16, I can do the miraculous. Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ. Colossians 3, verse 12, I am loved by God. Come on, somebody give God a shout of praise today. Don't believe the lie. Don't believe the lie. I believe God's setting people free right now in this place from the lie. Stop looking in the mirror and thinking you're worthless. Come on, you're God's treasure. Close your eyes. In Jesus' name. Lord, I speak over every life, every person in this room right now, people watching online right now. And we break the lies of the enemy. Lord, we speak truth. It is written. God, we just spoke through scriptures. Your word that declares who we are. And Lord, I pray that every person will walk out of this time free with their head held up just a little higher. We're not going to let the enemy steal our identity anymore. We're not going to let the enemy silence us anymore. But God, we're going to stand for truth in a world that's continually confused. Lord, help us to be a light in the darkness. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. When it comes to our identity, the first thing in our identity, I was, I was watching Pastor Jurgen yesterday, and he, and he wasn't even preaching a message. It wasn't about this, but I love what he said. And I said, I'm going to steal that for today, but I give him credit. He said, you need to know whose you are before you will know who you are. I'm going to say that one more time. You need to know whose you are before you'll know who you are. How does that start today? Simply by surrendering your life to Jesus. What a great way to change your identity. And, and by the way, I said a bunch of scriptures. We got these cards. You can, they're handing them out. When you leave, grab one of these. We got those scriptures on there. Some of you need to put this on your mirror. You need to start your day reading this, speaking these things to yourself to reaffirm your identity in Christ. 
but you need to know whose you are. And if you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to pray with you. you. Say, how do I become a Christian? It's simply by surrendering your life, saying yes to him. We can't earn it. We can't buy it. It's like we just say, nothing more I can do. God did it all. See, a lot of people say, well, you know, I, when it comes to identity, I was, I was born this way. I was born with this attraction. I was born with this way of thinking. I was born like that. I was born with the temper. I was born with lust. And if anybody were to ever tell me I was born this way, I would say, yes, I agree with you. You were born that way. That's why you need to be born again. I needed to be born again. You need to be born again. When I was born again, I got a new father. And I belong to him. You see, when I know who I belong to, I begin to understand who I am. Who I am. And I want to pray with you. I just sense the spirit of God here right now. God's doing things in hearts. I I want to just say this prayer, and I want you to pray with me. Church, let's join with those who are maybe online or in this room right now who are surrendering their life to Jesus. Let's say this together. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus I believe Jesus died for me. I also believe that he rose from the dead. He's alive in me today. I receive my new identity in Christ, in Jesus' name. And we all said amen and amen. Come on and just thank the Lord today. God bless you.